leave a comment on that video. Leave a comment on the video. So we have to find the video. And I think I'm in it now. Is it trying to be a clutch? There I am. Oh, that's just the photo. So I think I've had to do it this way last time. Peer-reviewed literature. 
They may contribute to books and patient education. They may present at grand rounds, and their work may be included in conferences, both biomedical communication conferences and the scholarly national conferences of medicine and research. And in many cases, as we'll hear this afternoon, their work is integrated into the teaching curriculum here at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. The topics are very broad, and this afternoon we're going to hear about six different research topics, which will be on airway management, healthcare innovation, the role of fundamental research in human health, gender affirming surgery, chewing in an ancient primate, and cardiac tissue engineering. And at the end of the presentations, Kari uh, is going to share with you how you could go about becoming more involved in actually um, serving as a preceptor of one of these extraordinary projects. Um, so having said that, it's now my pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers this afternoon, um, Lauren Graves. Um, Lauren comes to us with, from a BFA from Virginia Commonwealth University in Communication Arts, where she had a specialization in scientific and preparatory medical illustration and a minor in biology. Um, the fascinating project she's going to tell you about was particularly interesting to her because she was um, intrigued by the need to improve the patient's safety, the passion of the physicians she worked with, and she wanted a project that involved both illustration and 3D modeling. And she is the recipient of the 2018 Alan Cole Awards from the Vesalius Trust. So please join me now in welcoming Lauren. Thank you, Sarah. Today I'll be sharing with you my thesis project, creating an interactive algorithm for improved management of micronathic and retronathic infants. Infants can be born with congenital disorders that cause an underdeveloped jaw. This condition is known as micronathia, or retronathia when the jaw is posteriorly positioned. Micronathia is associated with a number of disorders, including Tierra sequence, future Tomlin syndrome, and Golden Heart syndrome. For this project, focus was given to Pierre sequence, or PRS. The incidence of children born with PRS ranges from 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 85,000, depending on the classification and identification of the disorder. PRS infants also present with glossoptosis, with a comparatively large tongue falls backwards and obstructs the airway, and sometimes a cleft palate. Micronathic anatomy causes a risk during airway management in which the anesthesiologist or otolaryngologist needs to intubate to provide oxygen to a patient. This can happen before surgery or even in an emergency situation. In either case, a physician unfamiliar with the anatomy and the techniques needed to intubate a micronathic infant can cause severe injury during the process. At this time, there are only a few resources available to help, to help train physicians to better manage difficult airways. The difficult airway algorithm created by the Society of Anesthesiologists shows a flowchart of steps and techniques that a user can follow in order to know how to manage a difficult airway. The algorithm is widely used and recognized by training anesthesiologists. However, this algorithm is only used to manage adult difficult airways. In order for it to be used for micronathic infants, it needs to be adapted to fit their specific needs. Other resources available include the Airway X app, a virtual intubation trainer for smartphones. While this app provides a realistic simulation of intubation it, um, adults and even sometimes children, it does not cover micronathic conditions. Additionally, AirSim was created by a micronathic infant simulation mannequin, as seen here. However, the mannequin is not widely, uh, not widely available in hospitals and is cost prohibitive, especially considering the relative rarity of the disorders. The goal of this project was to was to construct an interactive web application for learning and reviewing physical airway management in micronathic infants. The application would contain an interactive algorithm specifically made for micronathic infants and other resources to better understand the anatomy, such as a 3D model that can be rotated, have features turning on and off, and more. In order for the app to be as accessible as possible, it needed to be accessed on any computer. The audiences for this project are pediatric anesthesiology and otolaryngology residents and fellows, as well as certified registered nurse anesthetists. I'll now briefly 
quickly go through some of the workflows used to create this project. Creating a unique algorithm first required research and brainstorming with my thesis preceptors in order to find out the techniques and the equipment that a physician needs to know and understand in order to intubate a micronavic infant. This research was compiled into a flowchart using the online program draw.io. And the final algorithm was designed in Adobe Illustrator. To create the 3D model used in the application, I was provided with CT data from the Department of Otolaryngology here at Johns Hopkins Hospital. The CT data was of a pier within sequence infant. I segmented out the skin and the bone in Osiris and exported them as 3D meshes. These meshes were brought into, Z into ZBrush for refinement, and extra structures such as the larynx, the tongue, and cross-sexual anatomy were also sculpted. The model was finished in Cinema 4D and exported for use in Unity. Additional 3D renders were also made for the model. The artwork used in the web application started as line work in Adobe Illustrator. The line work was brought into Adobe Photoshop through color rendering. And some of the artwork was then brought into Adobe After Effects to create simple animations. An online PDF was created um, comp comprising of all the information included in the application. The PDF can be directly accessed from the application or saved and downloaded for offline review. The PDF was compiled in Adobe InDesign using previously created assets and hosted online. Printed booklets were also made of the PDF as an additional resource. The 3D model and the artwork were imported into Unity so I could begin to build the application. In Unity, the user interface was designed for each scene of the application. Assets were brought into each scene, and C Sharp programming was used to make user interactions within the application. Scripts were written to pan, rotate, and zoom the 3D model, turn features on and off, change materials, show and hide scroll views, and other actions that make an application interactive. Once the application was built, it was exported to WebGL format, which means that it can be played from any browser window, window without the use of additional plugins. <coughs> the resulting visuals from this project were one web, WebGL application, including one interactive 3D model, one interactive algorithm, 60 illustrations, including 18 3D render stills, 18 black and white illustrations, and 24 color illustrations, four animations, and one online PDF. Printed booklets were also made. Now I'll be sharing a few clips of the final application in use. The application starts on the title screen where you can access three different sections of the application. In the first section, the 3D anatomy section, you can rotate, pan, and zoom into a 3D model of a pier within sequence infant. The user can set anatomy to fade or turn features on and off to understand the anatomy as they explore. At any time, the user can also view cross-sectional anatomy by clicking sagittal. And this helps them truly understand the relationships between the anatomical structures. The model can also be snapped to predefined positions such as anterior, posterior, left, and right. And at any time, the model can be reset back to its original position. In the difficult airway algorithm scene, the user can zoom, pan, and click on steps in the algorithm on the left. The panel on the right updates to show text and steps about each text and illustrations about each step of the, of the algorithm. When the user clicks on zoom mode, the camera moves close to each step of the algorithm, allowing it to be seen on smaller screens. By exploring the algorithm, they can truly understand and be better prepared to intubate on a micronatic infant. the background information section, the user can explore categories on the left and read information on the right that shows text and illustrations to better understand some topics about micrographia. Finally, printed booklets were made as an additional resource to training physicians. Achievements during this project include creating a web application that has both, both 3D and 2D sections, as well as a unique algorithm that has the potential to contribute to infant safety. The project has received positive feedback from anesthesiologists and otolaryngologists who have had to manage micronephic infants, and the app has proved easy to 
use and easy to access. In creating this project, I've learned a new programming language and a new software that can help me in future endeavors. The application will be implemented into the education of training anesthesiologists at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and their feedback will be used to improve and expand upon the project. A challenge during this project was that I was not able to insert the 2D animations that I made directly into the version of Unity. Instead, I provided buttons that opened up the animations in separate tabs of the browser window, and this solution worked, but it was not entirely ideal. A future plan for this project would be to add specific case-driven examples to the algorithm, including both emergent and non-emergent situations, with a virtual patient. In this version, the explanations accompanying each step of the algorithm would be removed, and the focus would be placed instead on the decisions that the users make and the resulting outcomes for the patient. Ideally, in future versions, the Brady model would also be updated to include more details, such as vasculature and nerves, and more illustrations showing the techniques and equipment to be inserted into the application. There is also the potential to adapt this project for augmented reality or virtual reality so that the user can truly appreciate the scale of the infant anatomy. The application would also prove even more accessible if used on an iPad. The idea behind the interactive algorithm that is the heart of this project can be applied to teach many different medical topics and procedures, such as first aid, pain management, and emergency medicine. Utilizing it in these topics can lead to improved mental preparation, better decision-making skills, and optimal patient outcomes. I'd like to thank the many people that have contributed their time and knowledge to this project, including my thesis preceptors, Dr. Deborah Strangle and Dr. Jonathan Walsh. I'd also like to thank my faculty advisor, Dr. David Reedy. <laughs> Uh, and now I'd open the floor to any comments or questions from the audience. question from Facebook Live sure. uh, from Emily Ling. Uh, I think I missed this part and just wanted clarification, but were the 2D animations finished for this or just partially? And is that available on the web-based app? Yes, yeah, so I made four finished animations. They were really simple, just showing intubation and some, uh, some disorders such as like bradycardia that can happen during a situation like this. Um, they're finished and they can be accessed from the app. It's just not directly inside the application, so you can't view them. You have to click on external link. But they are finished, yes. Any other questions or comments? Okay.
Sarah Thompson. Um, before I get on undergraduate training at Brandeis University in Boston, where she studied neuroscience. Um, she has also studied painting at the Schiller School of Fine Arts. Um, as you'll see in her presentation, she's going to be um, using cartoons to explain a very complex topic, which is sort of interesting. We tend to think of the topics complex, maybe the explanations complex, but she's um, come up with something that shows how you can use cartoons um, to describe a very complex abstract model um, and it's also accompanied by a very engaging narrative. And uh, Zipporah is the recipient of a research grant scholarship from the Savings Trust. So please join me in welcoming Zipporah. resources from areas such as medicine, engineering obviously, but also business, law, humanities, etc. So in the past, the only, the only uh, corporations able to support this kind of innov innovation in this kind of industry were huge, big, you know, very established corporations. However, there's been a recent trend in the last 10 years where student startups have been able to start to compete with these large corporations in terms of the uh, innovation that they're able to contribute to the, the med tech industry. However, uh, these are student startups that are germinating in academic environments, and these academic environments traditionally don't necessarily teach students how to take their innovation and uh, you know, go from the bench to applying their innovation to the market. And so these startups may have, or these students may have a really brilliant innovation or an idea that fails to reach its users because there's no bridge, there's no navigational strategy. So the, uh, Dr. Yusuf Yasti and the Center for Bioengineering, Innovation, and Design developed this spiral model that was adapted from um, a, the original spiral model to apply to healthcare innovation. And as you can see, there's four quadrants or sectors, and each one encompasses a set of issues that are important to consider when uh, approaching the healthcare innovation. And so each one has set of considerations and issues that need to be um, addressed. And the spiral itself basically represents the progress that an individual project or product would go through over time and it kind of necessitates that you would pass through each of these sectors equally and gradually before committing more time and effort to a particular um, project or uh, uh, sector. So as you can see, it can be a very effective strategy, but it's complex and maybe difficult to communicate. So the goal of this project was to demonstrate this iterative model um, as it applies to a clinical example. And that would there then provide first-time innovators with this navigational strategy for taking their innovation and applying it to the market. And we uh, started to do this by creating a narrative animation using cartoons for communication. And the reason being that narratives are more retainable in terms of memory, and uh, cartoons are more um, relatable and engaging and can also uh, often be better at explaining abstract concepts. So our development strategy started off with a story outline, and this basically was just to make sure that all the learning objective objectives we had were incorporated into our message. Uh, then we had to choose an example clinical problem to carry our message and our, our narrative, and we chose pressure sores because they're conceptually simple, but they have a huge economic uh, burden to the healthcare industry, so it was a real example to use. The script writing and storyboarding, I put in bold because it really was the crux of the project. It required the most kind of iteration rewriting to get our communicate our message as clearly and effectively as possible. And then uh, I then took those storyboards and the script and I put them into a rough cut animation or an animatic, which was uh, used for quality assessment. It was a really helpful step in the process. Um, then using that feedback in the animatic, the final animation was able to be developed. Uh, even though this was what seemed to be a simple cartoon, a lot of programs were needed for its development. 
Um, I use the interpolation animation technique, which basically means that instead of the artist having to draw out each individual frame of the animation, the computer is calculating an object, uh, the intermediate frame, so the object moving from point A to point B. Um, and then I took from the content that I was explaining itself, and I developed the animation <coughs> iteratively. So instead of you know starting from the beginning and kind of making each part of it as finished as possible, I went through and I did complete passes of the entire animation so that there was a finished product at, at every stage that could be used and usable, uh, seen and usable. The final finished assets were uh, the modified spiral figure that you saw at the beginning, the animatic, and the full animation, which we will be watching now. <laughs> So, you're a medical student, Hello. say, third year. Your hospital is short-staffed and pressure sores are popping up everywhere. The patients are unhappy. The nurses are at their limit and it's costing the hospital thousands of dollars. There has to be a better way. You think you can solve this problem. Pressure sores might go down, but there are other problems. Scratch that. This time, you try getting advice from your resident. Now you're both excited. But solving this problem is more complicated than you expected. So, you book a meeting with a financial executive at the hospital, hoping for more support. You explain your solution, but he's not quite convinced. He says pressure sores are already expensive enough and your solution wouldn't save him any money. So now what? Don't worry. I'm here with a strategy to help you navigate your problem solving process. You've discovered that problem solving in the medical field is more complicated than you expected. First, let's organize these issues into four main categories, clinical, commercial, technical, and organizational. We call these sectors. You cannot address everything at once, so it's important to take an iterative approach. Iterative means that you build your understanding and solution gradually, over time, using feedback from stakeholders. That way, you don't miss anything. It's always best to start in the clinical sector. You're trying to solve an existing medical problem. Pressure sores can be prevented by frequent patient rotation, but if neglected, they can become dangerous and difficult to treat. So what's your angle? Treatment? Prevention? To better understand the problem, you hear from the patient, and then you hear from the nursing staff. Now you're on to something. But before you get too excited, consider all of the issues in the commercial sector. Remember, you need to think about the cost to the hospital and the patient. Who's going to pay for this? And what's already available in the market? How well does it work? How should your innovation be better? Your design will be shaped by understanding how current products fail to fully solve the problem. Now, you have an idea and you recognize the gaps in the market. Time to build something. That's in the technical sector. You call an engineering friend to help construct a product based on your idea. Together, you sketch out concepts, work through some technical problems, and come up with a rough prototype. Nice work. You've started to build your team. This is an important part of the organizational sector. You'll need to strategize about your plans moving forward and start thinking about funding for your project. You've done a great job addressing issues in each sector. It's time to pause and take stock. Do you feel you have a better solution overall? Yes, everything looks good. This is just the beginning. For your next iteration, you'll address the issues in each sector again, but now in greater depth. As before, you start by seeking clinical feedback. The patient says it's too big, and the nurse says it's too annoying. Turning to commercial issues, the hospital exec says it still seems too expensive. 
As for the technical issues, this feedback means you're able to move forward and improve your prototype. Lastly, organizational issues. Your working prototype and supporting research makes finding funding a little bit easier. Your team is bigger, and you've taken another turn through each sector. Now take stock again. Does your plan still make sense? Is the whole team on board for the next iteration? Great! Here we go again. The patient is comfortable, and the nurse approves. The hospital is beginning to see how your product can save money. You're off to a great start, but there's still a long way to go. Some of the steps ahead include seeking further advice on intellectual property, funding, clinical evaluation, and FDA approval. Just remember to continue working through all the issues, neglecting none by following the iterative model. This development path is called the Iterative Spiral Model of Healthcare Innovation. There will be many obstacles, but the potential strength of your project will increase as you gradually and equally iterate through each sector. With time, use of this model, and hard work, you can address all issues and navigate towards success. <laughs>
tweak, tweak in the level of different things can change the entire per perception of the entire animation. So I think really it was, I mean, I, I watched you go through this iteration over and over and over again, very much like the model. And I, I, I'm just blown away by, by, uh, by what you produced and that the residents, the, the nurses, and the other physicians that saw this in a number of lectures I gave at SIR on this topic were blown away as well. It actually took probably the, the, most of the meat out of my lecture by being able to show this. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, you said? Yeah, I just to add to that, I, I was really a wonderful experience the first time I've been involved in one of these. And I must say, interacting with you, Tempora, I think I actually made things clear to me. <laughs> and trying to communicate it to a novice, it, um, it forced us as a team to really think through the way we, we describe things. So that was a very useful exercise for us. And I think this video will be incredibly valuable to us in, in conveying this complex idea to future students. So thank you, thank you so a, much. It's really been a wonderful experience. For it's an educational process for me, too, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Anne. I have uh, two comments. Mm -hmm. I think that it was successful in so many ways. One in particular that you commented on in your, in your results was your um, the corner icon progression and how you allow that to thread through the whole storyline and reinforce the content, I think, um, in a very effective way so that once, some, once now that I've seen the whole cinematic, I understand an information graphic in much more depth than I would if I had not had your animatic content background information to explain it to me further. You also commented on your challenges with, I guess, you said didactic color. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah, so as you can see, the, all the characters were left uh, valueless and clueless, uh, mostly because it, just in terms of the technique that I used to create the animation where, you know, every person you see is broken up into parts where her arms are separate layers, her body separate layer, her face, her head, and her eyes are all separate layers, so that I could control each of those things in the animation. And so to then go back through and color each of those individual assets would have been another, just probably month of work in terms of the next iteration. And so I kept spot color for like the icon and for important parts of visualizations throughout the animation just so that there was focus but it didn't require another significant amount of work on my part to be able to finish the animation. So just to that point, I think it would be interesting to see that if you take it to the next level and you fully render your characters the way you would like to follow your <coughs> Disney art, um, mm -hmm. that if it detracts from the effectiveness of communicating the information mm. on the icon, it, it would be an interesting, that is interesting yeah. usability question. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I have two questions um, from Emily Ling on Facebook Live. Uh, the first is, can you elaborate on the solution you found for the quasi frame by frame, such as the program or the method? Yeah. The second question is, were there plans to break up the video in chunks by topic or sections? Uh, interesting. Okay. So the first, answer the first question, uh, basically everything that was kind of the quasi frame by frame, as you put it, is a good way to say it, um, are all layers in Photoshop. And I basically organized all those layers in Photoshop um, as they were like scene chunks. And then, you know, Photoshop and After Effects are able to connect really easily. And so I was able to import all those layers and have them be consistent and then just use transparency to switch between, you know, the arm like this and the arm like this and add a little bit of a bounce so it looks more realistic. That was all um, Photoshop and After Effects. The only part that I did fully frame by frame was the lip syncing for the mentor character, and that I did in TV Paint, which is a, um, a French animation program that I was able to get a copy of and um, makes it a really easy frame by frame process. Okay. And then what was the second question? Sorry. Were there plans to break up the video in chunks by topic or sections? Um, not really. There. Uh, the very, very early plan was to kind of make a sort of interactive video so that there were additional resources or you could go in different directions as if you were developing your own innovation, you know, like if you were making the decisions to develop that innovation. But it ended up being kind of a, almost an entire video game kind of project, which, you know, would have been a, a, an 
an additional thesis by itself. So we started with the just the the animation by itself as the project. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, 
poorly supported and well-founded scientific concepts. For example, science news on global climate change, transgenic food safety, and vaccines can largely shape people's everyday decision-making, but the sources are um, online or on TV and newspapers are often invalid. So over time, communication breakdown can happen between the science community and the public. And it can further lead to decreased research funding, lack of interest in pursuing careers in science, and the growing ignorance of the value of fundamental research and science. So this thesis seeks to bridge this critical gap by using a combination of visuals, including 3D animations, 2D motion graphics, user experience design, to create a video website to assist viewers in understanding why scientists do what they do. The target audience here would be uh, primarily the lay public, as well as scientists and biocommunicators who are interested in public outreach. To start the project, literature was reviewed to identify the previously mentioned problems. The study of cell mechanics in cancer metastasis and treatment um, conducted by the Robinson lab here at Johns Hopkins were chosen as the example to illustrate the research process and the approach uh, for several reasons. Um, first, the study shows a great value in medicine and cancer therapy, which really draws a lot of attention. The study integrates several subfields from cell biology, protein dynamics, computational biology, um, human histology, and chemical biology, and follows a relatively linear workflow, which I believe can provide a broad uh, view for the audience um, to understand the current biomedical research. Flowcharts and word story were developed based on the information and to show the flow of the information. Storyboards were created to show the layout design and transitions between scenes and pages. And it went, um, went through uh, several iterations based on feedback. Low poly style was selected for its simplicity and shorter render time. And I think it's a good way to visualize complex information. Isometric design was chosen to create 3D, a three-dimensional depth without distortion, which means that changes in size and position do not disturb the overall perspective, and it makes future adjustments much easier. With that style selected, 50 3D models were created using Super 4D showing research items, subject matter, and um, devices. And 15 animations were created uh, in Cinema 4D to show the generic amoeboid and cellular movements, as well as to, uh, mechanical motions. Then these um, art assets were brought into After Effects to create, combined with 2D motions to create the final animated videos. And finally, a scrolling site was built with a JavaScript preset called Scrollio, or technically scrolling triggered video playback. Um, this technique was originally developed by Mark Peter, who generously shared the code. We edited it and supplemented with HTML and CSS files to meet our demands. And this technique allows users to uh, watch the video based on their own pace by scrolling down and up. The alpha version of the website is now running on my local browser, and this is a clip showing me walking through it, and I'd like to share this. I, I'm also happy to show a real demo after this. So some of the texts are still, we're still working on them, but it, it should be. So this is the landing scene to draw attention. And this first part of the information briefly introduced the role of fundamental research in human healthcare. It consists of three pages, three paragraphs basically, 
and the progress bar on the side here indicates how much to expect. And this whole uh, progress is controlled by scrolling. The second part states the current health challenges like cancer and heart disease and how scientists are uh, driven by critical and basic questions trying to seek for solutions and uh, study the basic mechanisms behind the complex diseases. And this final part of the main page introduces a series of research strategy based on the uh, workflow from Dr. Robinson's lab. Viewers can click on each icon to read more about each strategy. It's also a scrolling page. And the content was de designed with three layers of um, information from general intro that scientists use research models to study complex topics to classic examples, and uh, finally to a specific case, the Tisidium here, um, amoebozoan, studied by the Robinson Lab to review important concepts of uh, cell mechanics and diseases. Um, the other pages are still under development. But the information of all these four sections are designed in the same hierarchy to um, navigate the viewer. So this website will be published by the Robinson Lab and also be uh, shown on my portfolio website. I'm planning to complete the content throughout the site and add a sticky footer with contact information to collect future user feedback. As a summary, the thesis project explored a streamlined workflow from anima animated videos to a video website, which allows easy adjustments in the future um, with the same framework of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So the videos here can be easily changed, uh, replaced, and controlled by that framework. And the scrolling effect, which is an up-to-date marketing strategy being used by companies like Google, Apple, and Sony, um, were studied during the course of this thesis and was incorporated into the scientific communication program. And finally, I'd like to thank all the people listed here for all the support along the way. Thank you. With that, I'll take questions and comments. I have a um, comment and two questions from Emily Ling on Facebook Live. She says, just a comment, I think the model design and style is aesthetically effective and beautiful. Thank you. And asks, lay audience is a target you mentioned, and I might have missed this, but what is the intended age range? Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, it could, it could be from like um, high school students who may be interested in getting into science or just the uh, average uh, public who have time to uh, browse on website. <laughs> it's just everybody. And the second question was, were there plans to include any audio components to the site? Yeah, I'm thinking about it. So one of the future plan is to, and now this video is on the same layer, but I'm planning to separate the layers and create multiple HTML canvas. And with that, I can embed it 
other video clips and even music into this website. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't think it's possible to do it on my own. I've, I've been constantly seeking for help from Dr. Robinson and uh, his uh, students in the lab for their feedback and their uh, suggestions, and also the faculty advisor, my faculty advisor, David Rini, um, for, um, uh, with the comment on the um, flow of the information. Because the audience are so broad, so I, I really need feedback from people with uh, various backgrounds. Is that your question? That was a question. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm very excited to see this uh, project come develop to the next step and so forth, and, and I think it's gonna be invaluable as we think about who all of our various stakeholders are in basic science, and being able to use this and route this around through various means. And answer your question, yes, we will be accessing other resources to help use, get this tool out. I think it's exciting, very exciting, good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted now to introduce our fourth speaker this afternoon. Hilary Wilson. Um, Hilary received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from High Point University. Um, she's going to share with you this afternoon um, a particularly fascinating project that was designed to help facilitate doctor patient communication and help improve patient decision making and compliance and hopefully, therefore, improve um, patient outcomes. Um, this is particularly I think very interesting project because of the very special and sensitive nature of it, and I think this really exemplifies the power of um, the biomedical communication to really help the patient um, and the physicians, and in this case also um, family members as well. Um, and Hilary is the recipient of the scholarship from the Mercedes Trust, so we're looking forward to hearing from her.
So patient education is extremely important, especially in bottom and facial surgery, because of the intimate nature of the areas being operated on, the large amount of decision making required, and the life changing nature of the procedures. Also, importantly, future healthcare providers may be unfamiliar with their patients' post operative needs and anatomy and have trouble providing optimal care. For example, in an emergency situation, a nurse may hesitate before inserting a catheter. So, to emphasize this lack of effective visual resources, I've shown a Google image search of vaginoplasties on the left and phalloplasties on the right. And most results are operative and post-operative photographs, which are helpful from a curiosity standpoint, but don't really teach anything. Um, and they're also often gory and off-putting. So the goal of this project was to create a clear, accurate patient education resource and help improve patient outcomes. And so here's a quick, a quick flow chart in my workflow. And as you can see, the stages of content review by surgeon and patient were ex required multiple iterations of artwork. I used Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator to create art assets, so it's pretty simple. And I'll start by showing the final images of the vaginoplasty series, which includes four illustrations describing one procedure. I chose four illustrations because this provides more context for the complex surgical changes of vaginoplasty. So here's an establishing image. A male to female vaginoplasty is made possible with penile disassembly and inver inversion. I color coded the illustrations to help track tissue movement. And you can see the major tissues involved in this procedure. So the penis, the scrotum, the glands and corpus cavernosum, the urethra and neurovasculature. To start, the penis is degloved, and the cavernosum erectile tissue, shown in green, is removed. The tissue from the scrotum, shown in turquoise, contributes to the depth of the, of the vagina in addition to penile tissue, shown in pink. Most patients who have been circumcised do not have enough tissue from penile skin alone, and the glands is shaped into a clitoris. So the penile scrotal skin tube um, is turned inside out and inserted into the body becomes the vagina. The scrotum, in addition to becoming part of the vagina, also contributes to the labia majora. The stretching action of the inversion of the tube creates a pouching effect that looks like labia. And this series of image, images teaches patients <coughs> and future healthcare providers about resulting anatomy um, and provides context for post-operative maintenance, such as vaginal dilation and complications, such as rectovaginal fistulas. The other type of bottom surgery I'd like to focus on is female to male phalloplasty. And I produced three illustrations for three sequential procedures. A phalloplasty is the creation of a penis from skin, nerves, and vessels from a donor site on the patient, usually the forearm or the thigh. And this series was designed to teach female to male patients what to expect after each surgery and what they need to do postoperatively. So here in this image, you can see the arrangement after the first surgery. The phallus has been created, but the female anatomy is left largely unchanged. You can see how inserting a catheter may be difficult. The patient must also urine out, uh, urinate out of their original urethra and dilate the healing neourethra with a catheter. In the second image, the vagina is removed and flaps from the labia are used to create a scrotum. The clitoris is embedded beneath the skin at the base of the penis and the knee urethra is attached to the existing one to lengthen the urinary tract. The patient can now urinate while standing. And finally, in stage three, a penile prosthesis or stiffener is inserted. Sexual intercourse using the neophallus is possible once the patient is healed. Now, one of the main pre-surgical considerations of phalloplasty is the donor site, so forearm versus thigh. And this series of four illustrations was designed to answer frequently asked questions that are difficult for the surgeon to convey verbally to the patient. And here, the results of a tube in tube forearm phalloplasty in green are compared with a tube in tube thigh phalloplasty in blue. Tube in tube refers to rolling a new urethra inside of the penis. 
The patient can learn about the differences in thickness and innervation of the donor sites, and the forearm is a logical choice if the patient wants a length in your urethra, higher sensation, and a penile prosthesis, which many do. A tube and tube phallus is always four thicknesses of donor skin. So imagine a penis being as thick as the skin and fat of the average thigh four times. Then add on the thickness of a stiffener. For most patients, a five phalloplasty means a less prominent scar, but an extremely thick phallus that can't be used for intercourse. And speaking of scars, I also made an illustration for that. <laughs> and this illustration explains the use of dermal regeneration templates in improving scar appearance. So DRTs serve as a scaffold for dermis growth and prevent some of the contraction of the scar during healing. And moving on to facial surgery. In transgender healthcare, facial surgeries, which are not covered by insurance, are more prevalent for feminization than masculinization. In general, individuals face less unwanted scrutiny as a feminine appearing male than a masculine appearing female. Therefore, it is easier to justify paying out of pocket for facial surgery during a male to female transition. My facial feminization series depicts surgically plausible results with three different racial phenotypes, black or African American, white or Caucasian, and Asian. And they're a useful tool because they have consistent lighting and angles and facial expressions to allow for threat comparison. So here I've shown one of the illustrations depicting a black patient before and after. The illustration gives information about the differences between masculine and feminine bone structure. And the two views provide multiple visual cues to help the viewer understand the subtleties of complex facial plastic surgery. Here's the Caucasian patient before and after. In addition to the FFS illustrations, I also designed the interface for an interactive module. The pa this patient resource goes into further detail and allows the viewer to explore and learn on their own and get much more information than is possible from a static illustration. So here you can see the screen with patient three, the Asian patient, selected in a front view. And here the nose has been selected. The module provides more detailed information on the selected part of the face, what procedures are involved, and how it relates to the patient of the selected race. For example, in Asian patients, the nose is often relatively wide and the bridge less defined. Giving the patient too defined of a bridge would make the nose appear more African American. Making the nose too narrow and the bridge too defined would make the nose appear more Caucasian. The surgeon takes extra care to maintain the distinct qualities that are specific to the patient's race while also maintaining the individuality of their features. And clicking the image in the center toggles between masculine and feminine. So I created 11 full color, surgically accurate patient education illustrations on bottom surgery, three full color illustrations for FFS, and a total of 31 distinct images. I also developed the design of an interactive resource for patients. The illustrations are currently in use at the Johns Hopkins Center for Transgender Health. And to illustrate why this project was important, here's a quote from Dr. Kuhn. Try it out on an FFS patient today, and it seemed to turn on a light bulb about forehead contouring, and words didn't. And with that, I'd like to thank my mentors, Corey Sandone and Dr. Kuhn, and this project wouldn't have been possible without their patient and guidance, their patients and guidance. Another special thank you goes out to Sarah Pointy for her advice and confidence boosts. And I think it's very important to mention Melissa, Dr. Kuhn's coordinator, for fitting into his busy schedule. And with that, I'd like to answer any questions you may have. a comment from Heidi Hildebrandt and a question, or sorry, another comment uh, from Emily Ling. Heidi says, awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> Emily says, comment, this thesis is amazing. Absolutely love the addition of nuances and details between racial groups.
Um, I think there's always looked like a ton of ground to be covered for all of that because just in general, I, I feel like um, the public who is not directly involved often doesn't really know anything about it. And then there's often not that many resources that are tailored to um, these different populations that have very you know, different needs. Um, so I think just in any situation, it's always helpful to have more um, you know, outreach and everything for all of that. And then I also think that in the cases where there's maybe differences in um, health care and health treatment for these individuals, it's very important to make sure that there are resources so that the uh, individuals can feel like there is stuff for them. I think that's very important and very important for um, just feeling like you trust the healthcare system, it's just knowing that it's there. <coughs>
they want to know as much as they, as they can, um, I guess, possible. And so I think it's just a lot of the time when um, you go on the internet and you're looking for information on these types of surgeries, there's just a lot of conflicting um, information and it's very hard to make sense of what everything is. And a lot of the time that, um, patients might get, or just, you know, people who are considering it or want to know more, they just get a lot of extra noise that just makes it so that they don't really know what's accurate, what isn't accurate. So I think if there is a way to have um, it be so that there is something that people know has been content reviewed by you know, a John Hopkins surgeon and that it's specifically designed to teach patients, I think that could be very, very helpful and just make it and just cut through some of the extra noise and then also um, let people know what is possible. To, and I think it would be just the best, um, you know, approach to eventually make some sort of a web resource that is um, that does have information, extra information, maybe explains more about um, other, you know, surgeries that are possible and things like that, and just um, is a full resource, full web resource that is easily accessible. Because you know, even though it's on my um, my website, you know, not that many, you might not want to go to sort through my, you know random portfolio website to find this information. So I think it would be my most pressing um, desire would be to make an actual website that has all of it. And maybe links to Hopkins or something. I don't know. Just, just Hopkins. <laughs> I think the appropriate home for that would be for the with the Johns Hopkins Center for Transgender Health, which has this is a perfect example of the collaboration I just want to comment on the beautiful artistic talent that you're showing here in the images. They're beautifully done and very accurate. And I think that uh, they show uh, exactly uh, the changes in the, uh, especially the facial ones, the portraiture, are, are just excellent. occur 
7 million years ago. But the first primate occurred 50 million years before that. Studying the origins of all primates can help explain our own evolutionary history. The Department of Functional Anatomy and Evolution at Johns Hopkins has acquired a fossilized skull of one of the earliest known species of primates, named Smilodectes racilis. This small lemur-like mammal was found in Wyoming and is estimated to be over 50 million years old. The study of an animal's chewing anatomy is a way for exciting inferences to be made about its diet, body form and function, and how it fits in evolutionary history. The study of fossil anatomy has traditionally been limited to bony structures. However, Dr. Perry and colleagues have developed a unique method for gaining even more information about chewing anatomy by using bone measurements to calculate the muscle volume. This is exciting because no soft tissue remains on fossils and it becomes difficult to study. The primary goal of this project is to discover more about primate origins by studying Smilodectes racilis' chewing anatomy using Dr. Perry's novel technique. In achieving this goal, a few problems occur. The bony measurements required for the muscle volume calculations can be difficult to obtain with fossils as ancient as this one. Having been subject to eons of geological stress, the fossil is damaged and full of sediment. When the muscle volumes are attained, they are still difficult to visualize as they are just static numerical figures. And finally, because virtual paleontology is relatively new, methods for sharing CT data and 3D models have not been fully developed or standardized. To solve these problems, I first digitally refurbished the fossil so that the muscle volume measurements could be made. I then virtually reconstructed the resulting muscle volume measurements to give a 3D visual representation of the numerical figures. I also animated the muscles in a chewing simulation to truly bring this data to life. Finally, I utilized WebGL interactive software to present a unique solution for, sol for sharing the resulting models, making them accessible to the scientific community and students. The methods I used involved a variety of artistic and science-based software. The first step was to use Avizo, a 3D visualization software for scientific and industrial data, to create a surface model from the raw CT data of Smilodectes cranium and mandible. The software also allows for some of the sediment to be segmented away, leaving a highly fractured model composed of many pieces. I then imported these surface models into ZBrush, an artistic 3D sculpting software, and was able to manipulate each of the individual pieces. I was able to piece the fossil back together and correct its distortions. I restored the fossil using a conservative approach, meaning I only made changes I could justify and preserved as much original anatomy as possible. I used photos of living equivalents as references. Any anatomy I added, I kept separate and color coded. This is the model that Dr. Perry made the bone measurements on to calculate the chewing muscle volume. The digital measurements were used using geomagic. The surface areas of the origin and insertion points, as well as distance between bony landmarks, were measured and used to calculate the jaw adductor muscle volume. When the muscle volumes were calculated, I used the data to sculpt the three jaw adductor muscles. I used photo references of dissections of modern equivalent species as references. I then used the 3D modeling and animation software Blender to calculate the volume of my models to ensure that they match the data. I also used this program to add materials and textures to my models and to rig the jaw and musculature to move in a realistic way. I used biomechanical data from primate chewing cycles to base my simulation on. I also took great care to ensure that the muscles conserved their volume while moving. To create an interactive web application, I used a new open source program called blend for web that allowed for 3D interactive application to be created with high quality graphics using little to no programming. 
The software uses WebGL technology, allowing the application to be accessed by anyone with the internet. Lens for Web is growing in popularity and has recently been adopted by NASA and was used with the 2018 Winter Olympics website. This project resulted in both hard data as well as virtual visualization of that data. The hard data includes the muscle volume estimates of the masseter, temporalis, and medial carotid muscles as seen in this figure. This data was also visualized in an on-land interactive application that is composed of four segments. The first section of the application shows the user uh, allows the user to view the original CT fossil scan as well as the refurbished fossil. A key is shown to indicate that the added anatomy is in black and the original CT scan is in green. Keeping the distinction clear is important for scientists who are interested in the specifics of the alteration or would like to see the original fossil. Comparisons between the two are easily made by toggling between the models using the buttons on the left. The second section presents the three jaw adductor muscles. The masseter temporalis and medial pterygoid were virtually reconstructed based on the bone measurements taken from the refurbished model. The user is able to turn off and on each muscle to view the underlying skull as well as the origin and insertion map. The red colored areas indicate muscle origin and the blue indicates muscle insertion. Being able to interact with the 3D structures is useful for students who are studying anatomy. Here you can see the user is able to manipulate the model and gain access to the best view of each muscle and toggle it off and on to appreciate the specific origin insertion point. The third section presents the adductor mus muscles in action in a virtual chewing simulation. The species was likely a foliivore, meaning that it consumed leaves, and such a diet would involve some heavy chewing. Chewing involves both the opening and closing movements of the jaw and the sagittal plane, as well as lateral movements. The graph tracks the tip of the jaw to emphasize the jaw's lateral displacement during a chewing cycle. The motion and timing of this simulation was based off the biomechanical chewing data of living primates.
In conclusion, this project was able to facilitate the acquisition of and visualization of new chewing muscle data, which contributes to the conversation about the origin of primates. It created the first animated interactive model of extinct primates chewing apparatus, including a refurbished skull, jaw adductor musculature, chewing simulation, and facial approximation. These projects, these products were created using a full range of artistic and scientific software and a data from a variety of fields of study. The process was also able to provide novel paleontological imaging workflow. I would like to thank Dr. Perry and Timothy Phelps, Sarah Pointing and my department and classmates. Thank you. Thank you. 
research into interactive didactic innovation for cardiac tissue engineering. Um, and I was working with the Grace Lab for craniofacial and orthopedic tissue engineering. So the heart myocardium is a thick layer of muscle that is in the walls of the atrium and ventricles. It is mainly composed of cardiomyocytes, contractile cells. And after a myocardial infarction or heart attack, the cardiomyocytes around the occluded vessel will die and do not regenerate. And so to regenerate cardiomyocytes, tissue engineers are developing a cardiac patch, which is a cell-covered matrix that can be grown in the lab and it can be sutured onto the myocardium. The cells in the patch integrate with the native heart tissue to provide mechanical and electrical support at the area of damage. And a novel triculture method was developed here at John Hawkins to uh, do this. So over um, 21 days, uh, they built this patch. And if we zoom into a piece of it, you can see distinctly the capillary and contractile cardiomyocyte layers that are uh, three different cell types that are grown on the fibromyalgia scaffold. So how are these processes visualized? Um, well, t tissue engineers will gather images of living and fixed cells. In this light microscopy image, um, you can see live cardiomyocytes that are beating or contracting in culture. They also use pump hole microscopy uh, to observe the internal uh, structures. And here in this cardiac patch, you can observe the internal structures of cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells. However, note that there is no cellular motion as these cells have been fixed and are dead. So these techniques are sufficient for researchers to understand what is happening at the cellular level, but we found that it was difficult for novice students to understand the cellular, to understand the cellular processes for raw cell imaging, partially because the bioscaffold was not imaged and not all cell types were shown concurrently or staying for. So as novel research uh, is protocol that a cardiac patch are developed, tissue engineering sh students should be able to see the interactions between the cells. So it was our solution to use 3D data sets to visualize the, the forces that drive cellular interactions and substrate cell interactions to create building a cardiac patch animation that would teach this novel triculture method and use this to interactively link concepts in the animation to an online uh, learning module and the primary audience for this would be uh, biomedical engineering students and tissue engineering graduate students. So after a review of the literature, we conducted interviews uh, with students in the principles of tissue engineering course to identify learning goals. From there, a learning module was uh, created and content was curated based on those learning goals. We then created websites, storyboards, and a flowchart to demonstrate the overall website uh, organization. Uh, eight different types of regenerative, regenerative tissue were chosen, and of those, uh, we chose to focus on heart muscle. And within that, an interactive animation was developed to, again, demonstrate that link between the content that's in the animation and the heart muscle content. So we created a script of this interactive animation, and then, uh, sketch roughly 60 storyboards to convey the exact visuals and the narration that would be tied with it and demonstrate where there would be an interactive link to that website content. We chose to focus on only the cellular component for the full visualization. And so we gathered a table of relevant cellular proportions. And this was to uh, facilitate the creation of the 3D models. Um, using this cardiomyocyte as an example, uh, we used Confolva Microscopy 3D data sets. Uh, this one provided by the Welsh Lab at the University of Oslo to segment T2 real data to create a surface mesh. Uh, this was done in Fuji. Then this mesh was imported into ZBrush, and the mesh is seen here in that image as a red network structure. And then a cell body was sculpted over that, which is in white. Uh, the, the mesh was optimized with other viewing other data sets, and then this was sent to Cinema 4D to do the, um, to composite with the other cells and for cameras and lighting and materials. And the other two cell types that we were 
focusing on the endothelial cell uh, on the lower left and the uh, human adipose for our stem cell were created in a similar way. Additional cellular data sets provided by the Grayson lab were used to visualize the appearance of a cardiomyosate sheet and then used actual case rate studies from uh, cardiac patches to accurately animate contraction. And this was all done in cinema recording as well. So after creating 2D illustrations and building the proposed website in uh, WordPress, the interactive software TouchCast was used to uh, program the interactive web page links into the completed 3D animation. As a result, the following assets were developed, which I will not go over. So the first one is uh, the animation itself. So I'll wait for you now. Stin Kistra, building a cardiac patch. To create a cardiac patch, various cell types are seeded onto a fibrin bioscaffold, which is wrapped around a mylar frame and approximately 300 microns thick. A droplet of solution is placed on the fibrin. The solution contains cardiomyocytes, which attach to the fibrin bioscaffold. The cells are immersed in solution that contains nourishing media and a protein, which inhibits breakdown of the fibrin bioscaffold. The solution is refreshed every other day as the cardiomyocytes elongate, guided by the parallel alignment of the fibrin bioscaffold. Between days four to seven, the cardiomyocytes begin to spontaneously contract. Binding sites called adherence junctions form structural connections between adjacent cardiomyocytes. These sites develop into intercalated discs. Gap junctions that also form at the intercalated disc allow electrical signal propagation between cardiomyocytes, facilitating synchronized contraction. After 14 days, a four to one ratio of endothelial cells and human adipose derived stem cells, or HASCs, are seeded onto the cardiomyocytes to start the growth of the blood vessels. Refreshed every other day with a composite of stem cell and endothelial growth media, the endothelial cells elongate and undergo vasculogenesis to form new blood vessels. The cells elongate to multicellular cords. Intercellular vacuoles unify to create a hollow lumen. The HASCs are mesenchymal stem cells. They can mimic perivascular cells by stabilizing the endothelial vessels. The HASCs also mimic fibroblast cells by secreting an extracellular matrix that envelops the endothelial vessels and cardiomyocytes. New research results suggest that HASCs may form gap junctions with cardiomyocytes and contribute to contraction. HASCs may also promote angiogenesis by secreting paracrine signaling factors such as VEGF and BFGF. They also secrete exosomes or vesicles filled with growth factors and microRNA, the effects of which are still unknown. These carefully orchestrated interactions between endothelial cells, HASCs, and cardiomyocytes form new functional tissue. The complete vascularized cardiac patch is able to integrate with the native heart tissue and support heart function after myocardial infarction. Uh, 
uh, graphics were, and icons were created to navigate on the uh, interactive website. Next, I will uh, walk you through the learning module. So here at the home page, uh, viewers can navigate into the Heart Hustle section and can view additional materials on tissue engineering topics, such as this uh, piano biology illustration. Or they can navigate back and enter the interactive uh, media page, where there's the uh, animation or additional interactive content. And when they watch the, uh, so this is a touch cast animation that has an interactivity program into it, which is that blue square. Click to learn more about how bioscaffolds influence cell growth. And at this point, they can select a link that appears. It'll take them to that, uh, that illustration on the web page. They can read as much as they like, take their time to learn the material, and return to the animation and just pick up where they left off. We successfully visualized these cellular interactions in the triforce environment over a uh, 21 day time span and created a uh, learning module that we would like to expand into an online textbook of resource for students in sports. And as far as we can tell, we demonstrated a novel use of this TouchCast software in biomedical communication. And this is available at uh, the following website and 3D animation and illustrations are going to be used in the course here at Johns Hopkins next week. It's also illustrations from this uh, project are being included in a book chapter in this forthcoming uh, book. And we found that with web-based interactive animation um, to be successful, that uh, to have rapid playback, it would be best to pre-render the 3D, uh, 3D animation. We found that students like the ability to be able to view materials without having to leave their animation screen. And the uh, module has a responsive design just for the way it's built. And future applications of this technology, or uh, for the workflow, I'd like to see it applied to other stem cell protocols for regenerative medicine, and use uh, TouchCast to cite data sets and publications more specifically within scientific animation. So I'd like to thank, um, I've had so much support from everyone here, but I'd specifically like to thank Linda Gray for her support on this project, and uh, Laura Grayson and Justin Forsett with Coleman for working with me in the uh, biomedical engineering department. Um, additionally, Molly Melkar at the Allen Institute for Cell Science provided some additional cardiovascular data sets and put me in touch with uh, the group at the University of Oslo who provided this beautiful work. Of course, everyone in the faculty and staff are just like medicine. So, yeah, I'll take questions now.
On Facebook Live, uh, John Dorn on the faculty of Iowa State University <laughs> says, congrats, Shauna. proposal 
by May 15th. Uh, I hope you can see my email up there. If not, I'm easy to find Corey Sandone, C. Sandone at jhmi.edu. Um, you fill out a one page proposal. I have some copies that are hard to miss. They're in green on the corner there. You can email me for a, a digital version of it where you just describe the visualization challenge that you have. The next step is that our students read all the proposals and then uh, as small groups they meet with the preceptor, whoever is interested in the, um, in the project and they learn more about the project in the lab or the clinic um, where the preceptor works. And then the students make a selection based on how they think they can best help a potential preceptor with their project. So please let me know if you're interested. Uh, that wraps up our full day of the first day of the student exchange and our student thesis presentation. We have a reception out in the foyer, so I hope you'll join us and have another opportunity to talk a little bit more with the students who presented. Thank you very much.